In the world of multiplayer gaming, to be a griefer means that you're aiming for different end goals than the other people playing the game. Often this is the consequence of the mechanics of the game itself, and there are people who go into the game looking for alternative ways to win from the outset, goals that are meaningful to them, but not meaningful to the other players, who are themselves usually adhering to the goals as outlined by the game itself. In practice, this might mean that the majority of players in an online game are trying to defeat the other team, or trying to work together to solve a puzzle or slay a dragon. A griefer, though, might decide that it would be more fun, more interesting, more challenging, to keep their team from ever solving that puzzle, by surreptitiously stealing one of the keys that they require to do so. They may decide that it would be more fun to try to continuously kill the members of their own team from behind without their team realizing it, or while convincing their team that it's an accident, that they're just a new player who is simply so bad at the game that they keep shooting their own team by mistake. They might decide that it would be funnier to keep their team from ever reaching the dragon in the first place by standing in the doorway that leads to the dragon's cave, preventing anyone else from ever entering. Griefing is not harmless, it's not consequence-free, because it puts the griefer in direct opposition to everyone else in the game. It would be like playing Monopoly with someone who has decided that they're not going to try to win by the normal rules, and instead that they will try to steal their opponent's fake money whenever they get up to use the restroom. And the goal is not to get caught. They are adhering to different rules and metrics of success, and that can then impact the fun that everyone else has playing the game, and very often negatively so. There is a mixed sense about griefing in gaming communities, with some players thinking that it's a lot of fun, often or sometimes enthusiastically griefing themselves, while others look down upon it as childish and lame, and as something that disrupts otherwise wonderful communities of players trying to have a good time, everybody adhering to the same rules and attempting to overcome the game's established goals together. And there's an interesting sub-conversation happening within the game maker community about this same topic, with some developers of games trying to figure out how to punish griefers to keep them from ruining the other player's experience, while others are looking at the larger context, attempting to figure out what causes people to grief in the first place. After all, this line of thinking goes, these players seem to think that they will have more fun making up their own rules, setting their own victory standards, than they would if they played by the rules that are provided by the game. As game makers, isn't that kind of on us? Might it not be prudent to look into that, figure out why people are not finding the game itself, the game mechanics and victory conditions and challenges themselves, compelling enough to stay engaged with what they've built? Why isn't Monopoly itself enough to keep people from having to come up with this separate set of rules, in other words? Might we design things so that people don't feel the need to become griefers in the first place, so that they'll instead want to win according to the rules and standards provided to them, bringing everyone into alignment by default? There are some within this space, though, who believe that many griefers, not all of them, but many of them, are not just griefers, but also trolls. Trolling, as opposed to griefing, is committed by people who are operating within the meta-context of the gaming world, while griefers will often mess with the rules within the game to create a new sub-game of a kind for themselves, sometimes causing grief in the process. Trolls will step into the game with the intention of disrupting it, with the intention of getting people riled up and angry. They'll shout racist nonsense, they'll insult other players, they'll start fights, the idea is to see if they can pull people out of the game, stir them up, and the internal reward that they get is tied to their ability to influence how others are feeling in real life, rather than anything directly tied to the context of the game. Some game makers and gamers, then, contend that many griefers are just trolls who are operating tactically, using game mechanics to cause a stir and that they would go out of their way to do that no matter how good the game becomes, because that's what they do. They enjoy catalyzing controversy and messing with people, and feel a sense of glee, of superiority perhaps, from doing so. It's kind of like a kid breaking bottles on the ground for no reason. They get some kind of psychological reward from influencing their environment, and maybe feeling a sense of power over it, getting a sense of power from doing so. 
Research has been done, and papers have been written, as to the why behind this propensity, both in adolescents and teenagers and in internet trolls, many of whom are fully grown human beings, mostly but not exclusively men, and many of whom seem to really get off on the idea of being able to upset other people through a combination of insults, harassment, and bad faith arguments. This approach to interaction can have such a powerful effect on others, though, on people who are trying to engage with each other, with games, with information, with whatever else on the internet, that it's become a potent means of creating discord within online communities, to the point where it's even reportedly being weaponized by state actors to keep groups from unifying and working together, and to keep information dissemination muddled. An increasingly widespread example of that latter case are the multitude of automated troll accounts being utilized by a variety of different entities, perhaps most famously, though, and provably, by Russian-funded web brigades, sometimes referred to as troll farms or troll armies, to sow discord and create a sort of fog of war in online spaces, from Facebook to Twitter to forums set up for players who are engaging with certain online games. These troll armies are often based elsewhere. North Macedonia is maybe the most well-known base for a lot of the people operating these botnets, but they're nowhere near the only base of operations for this type of thing. And many governments fund them to fake support for certain issues, to stir up animosity between groups that might otherwise work together, and to imply controversy around just about anything. If you tweet about a particularly controversial topic, something political, for instance, and especially something that is somewhat divisive, part of the response will come from bots that auto-respond to such posts, arguing with the poster or supporting them or both, with sometimes garbled, sometimes quite sophisticated and human-sounding chunks of text intended to amplify perceived rifts and or to give news networks something to latch onto and report upon, creating a story where there was not a story, creating conflict out of whole cloth, and in some cases stoking a spark into a much larger conflagration. It says something, I think, that this tactic is so effective on so many platforms to the point where some entities are using it as a weapon. While many individuals continue to do it for laughs, for fun, as something that gives them a sort of pleasure, this implies to me that there's something latent in many of us that wants to be outraged, but also that wants to see things burn, wants to create conflict and revel in that conflict, to see what we can get other people to do, to see what we can get away with, to break bottles on the ground for no better reason than it makes us feel powerful and in control of our environment. Look what I can get away with, look what I can do. It also implies that many of the networks that we're using today are perhaps a bit like the games that are failing to keep people engaged enough to play by the rules, and are instead creating incentives for people to do more griefing and trolling instead of adhering to the laws of the land that people are ostensibly supposed to follow within these networks. If a social network doesn't serve us as a public forum, maybe it would be more fun to see who we can rile up and get angry. If a network seems to amplify the worst voices over the more moderate and reasonable ones, well, maybe we should see just how horrible we can be and see how far such messages travel before someone does something about it. That seems to be the thinking here, in many cases at least. What I want to talk about today is antisocial behavior online and the impact that such behavior can have in the real world. <music> listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. If you're finding some value in what I'm doing here on this podcast, consider becoming a supporter. One of the easiest ways to do this is at patreon.com slash let's know things. And if you contribute any amount through Patreon, you'll gain access to an additional episode of the show each month alongside a few other small benefits. There are other ways that you can support the show financially as well. You can find links to those options at letsknowthings.com but also very helpful is supporting the show non-monetarily by sharing it with a friend, leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts, and or sharing your favorite episode on your social network of choice. A huge thanks to everybody who's already supporting the show in some way, shape, or form. I truly appreciate that. Thank you. All right, let's get back to the show. <music> The article I'd like to start with today comes from the New York Times, and it's entitled, People Are Calling SWAT Teams to Tech Executives' Homes. 
There are a handful of components to this story that warrant explanation, I think, before we get into the broader context of what this trend means. Let's start with the term swatting, which is a relatively new iteration of a classic move meant to take advantage of public services to achieve some specific goal. To mess with someone pranking a friend or public figure, or just to waste public resources. SWAT, S-W-A-T, is the acronym for Special Weapons and Tactics. And in the United States, a SWAT team is a law enforcement unit that has special equipment and training to prepare them for dealing with direct confrontations with armed criminals, with bomb threats, with hostage situations, with terrorism of all shapes and sizes. Anything beyond normal police action, essentially, is their wheelhouse, and they're often more militarized to face the special situations that they encounter as a consequence. They get automatic weapons, sniper rifles, tear gas, stun grenades, body armor and riot shields, tools that help them break down doors and break through windows, and even armored vehicles and night vision goggles. If you've seen police forces dressed up like military personnel in a film or TV show, breaking down doors and setting up snipers on the roof, arriving in armored vehicles or helicopters, that was probably a SWAT team. So these teams are armed to the teeth compared to normal cops, and they're sent in to save people who are being held hostage to defuse bombs and either negotiate with or take out very dangerous individuals. Swatting, then, is calling the police with false information in an attempt to get a SWAT team called on someone's home. Doxing is the practice of finding people's personal information, everything from their birthday and maiden name to their home address, and then posting this information on the internet, often in forums where they can be easily discovered and then utilized however the discoverer sees fit. Doxing unto itself is considered to be a type of harassment because the threat is implicit. It's built into the posting of this information. Now anyone on the internet can find you in real life, can use these details about you, to hack your email account or your bank, can find you and your kids and do whatever they're going to do. Swatters often utilize this kind of information, especially but not exclusively, the target's home address, to know where to summon the SWAT team. This information often includes things like when they go to work and whether or not they are home on weekends, so that swatting attempts will be more likely to succeed and will be more likely to catch that person at home. The idea being to either scare the bejesus out of them Again, the SWAT teams show up expecting a hostage situation, a bomb, or to otherwise face some kind of murderous individual, or to instigate a murder-by-cop situation, where the SWAT team thinks that one thing is happening and the people at the house think something else, they don't know that a SWAT team is coming, and thus the opportunity for misunderstanding and perhaps accidental injury or death arises. An unfortunate number of times, swatting has resulted in the death of the person who lives at the home to which the SWAT team was called, because the person at that home maybe stands at the window and holds a cell phone in a way that looks like drawing a gun from the people's perspective outside, and the SWAT team, thinking that they're dealing with a potentially murderous hostage taker, shoots them, because from their perspective, that will save the occupants in that home from a menace from being murdered. Swatting, then is an attack on both the person at the home, but also the police themselves. People who are going into the situation thinking that they're saving lives, saving the occupants of the home from a truly horrible situation, when in reality, they could be scaring and potentially psychologically scarring those inhabitants, or injuring or killing them, which is tragic on multiple levels, including for the people being tricked into doing that scaring and potential killing. Back in the day, Hoaxing law enforcement services was a little bit easier, as the tracking technologies involved were less sophisticated, and you could therefore call from a phone booth near a house and stand a decent chance of making something like this happen. Or you could do the same by calling in a bomb threat to your school to avoid taking a test, and a low-tech trick of that kind would stand a decent chance of working. Now these days, mobile phone triangulation being what it is, Law enforcement systems and the people taking the 911 emergency calls are a little bit cannier when it comes to ensuring that the calls that they receive are legitimate. They have more tools at their disposal to help them sort out the obvious hoaxes from legit calls, a lot of the time at least. That said, inexpensive and easy-to-access online tools can allow just about anyone to spoof phone numbers, making it look like these hoaxers are calling from anywhere, including from the house that they're trying to swat. In previous years, this was an insanely complicated trick that could be performed pretty much only by telephone infrastructure experts. 
But today, voice over internet protocol technologies, similar to what you use when you make a call with Skype or WhatsApp and other apps of that kind, can allow users to display entirely different numbers on the caller ID services used by the receiving party. So I could use one of these services to call a client from my mobile phone and make it look like I'm calling from my office. That's one of the legitimate uses of this technology, and the majority of the client base of these apps use them for this type of business purpose. The illegitimate use, of course, is to make prank phone calls, including to politicians and to radio shows, faking people out, and often then recording those prank calls for posterity or for one's YouTube channel. You can also use these tools to call up emergency services, making it look like you're calling from a home that you want to target, or from a home in the same neighborhood as that home, reducing the chances that emergency services will brush you off as an obvious hoax. They don't want to leave real victims without assistance after all, so it makes sense that they would default to believing what they're told in these cases, and these tools provide additional support for that default. This approach, as I mentioned, is partially enabled by doxing, which again often includes the target's phone number, among other details. And it's illegal in many countries to use these technologies to, quote, cause any caller identification service to knowingly transmit misleading or inaccurate called identification information with the intent to defraud, cause harm, or wrongfully obtain anything of value, end quote. But I think in most cases the people doing this sort of thing are not deterred by the $10,000 to $100,000 fine that they could face if caught and proven to have done what they did, which is what the law prescribes for such cases in the United States, with similar penalties found elsewhere. In many cases, of course, the perps do not intend to be caught to face such a fine in the first place. And in some cases, the person doing the spoofing is in another country entirely, and as such would be unlikely to ever have to face a trial in their target country. Interestingly, a solution to this part of the swatting problem may emerge as a consequence of the abundance of robocalls in places like the United States, where voice over internet protocol technologies have been allowed, and for many beneficial purposes, but which have also increased the quantity, many-fold, of computer-based robocall systems that can send out thousands of calls in the time it would have previously taken to make just one. And these callers can generally get away with it because of these spoofing tools. A collection of protocols called Stir Shaken, an allusion to James Bond's preference for his drinks to be shaken not stirred, and an acronym for Secure Telephony Identity Revisited and Signature-Based Handling of Asserted Information Using Tokens, a fairly forced acronym in my opinion, but I guess you have to find your joy wherever you can when you work for the Federal Communications Commission, this Stir Shaken system would essentially tag even spoofed numbers with what amounts to metadata that tells phone systems along the way who is actually calling, the true source of a call, rather than the faked, spoofed number. The benefit here is that government agencies would be able to peek beneath the surface and know right away who is actually calling them, potentially eliminating the ability of hoaxers to use this specific mechanism as part of their swatting efforts. And that's the downside as well, of course, eliminating some of the anonymity benefits of spoofing in the trade-off. Most consumers would probably still see the faked number, at least at first, but it's easy to see this transitioning to a for-everyone thing once that additional metadata becomes available, as long as carriers and other services are able to see and display it as well. I think most of us would want to see that legitimate number rather than the spoofed one, given the option. The Stir Shaken Protocol was added to the TRACED Act that was signed into law at the very end of 2019 in the United States. So we should see that rolling out sometime in 2020, and it's a fair assumption that similar protocols will be implemented elsewhere as well if it proves fruitful for the American phone market. In mid-2019, cybersecurity journalist Brian Krebs, who runs the amazing Krebs on Security blog, reported on an online community of neo-Nazi sympathizers who had created an organized doxing and swatting project oriented around a list of information about their targets that included notifications, little blue gun icons, when a particular target on that list had been successfully swatted. This list included federal judges, corporate executives, and over 30 journalists, including Krebs, the guy who was reporting on them, and some of his family members. The FBI arrested a member of this community, who was based in Virginia, for conducting these swatting attacks, as he was reportedly one of the members responsible for setting up and maintaining this online dark web-based group. 
meaning it's a web-based community that you cannot access using a normal browser or by typing in a normal web address. You need a special separate dark web accessing browser to find it, which is not unto itself a criminal thing. There is a lot of legit stuff that happens on the dark web, but which in this case gave the members of this group the ability to act while still keeping public documentation of their exploits. Being off the main browser infrastructure gave them the chance to do that in public without running the risk of tipping off the casual passerby as to what they are up to, as might be the case on the normal web. Several other members of this group have since been connected to mass shootings and online and offline abuse campaigns of various kinds, alongside all the swattings in the months since that initial arrest, and the crux of a new article posted by Krebs in January of 2020 is that while many of these white supremacist and often vehemently anti-women, anti-gay, and so on, terrorist suspects seem to be, from the outside at least, lone wolf killers, you can very often trace their radicalism back to online communities of this kind, which provides them with the tools that they use to commit these acts, but which also reinforce harmful ideas that they harbor, raising the question of whether lone wolf terrorists are actually ever lone wolves, or instead just part of a pack that's not as obvious as it would have once been, because of these means of surreptitious online connection. So looping back around to that original piece in The Times, we have reports that tech executives are being swatted, and at the center of this piece is a successful swatting that took place in November of 2019. The target, a senior Facebook executive named Adam Mosseri, who is the current head of Instagram, and who has homes in San Francisco and New York, both of which were targeted. The police told that hostages were being held inside these homes. The police barricaded the surrounding streets and for hours tried to communicate with the supposed hostage takers inside before realizing that there were no hostages and there was no one inside the targeted homes. Mosseri is apparently not alone in having been targeted by swatters recently, though hard numbers and specifics of the known examples are hard to come by as the individuals and the companies they work for are playing their cards close to the vest, trying not to give away anything about their security practices in case it gives potential swatters and other antagonists ammunition to use in the future, which is understandable, though it makes it a little tricky to know the scale of this particular facet of this larger problem. The final aspect of this story that I think is worth exploring, and which will then lead us to the broader context conversation, is that tech companies in general have been taking a beating in the reputation department of late. This is maybe just the natural consequence of an industry, the online tech industry in particular, and even more specifically, the data-gobbling online community industry. It's the consequence of that sort of industry coming of age, being heralded as purely good and awesome in its early days, and then, once we've caught a more nuanced view of them, seen the flaws, we've come to realize that everything isn't as peachy and pure as we thought. It's also quite likely that, as these businesses have scaled, and because of the nature of their business models, they've had to expand beyond the feel-goodish mantras they once chanted, because those concepts just aren't tenable at their level. Google removed the don't-be-evil credo from their purpose statement years ago, and the whole of that industry seems to have decided that those early days ideals are not compatible with what they've become, and what they want to become next. None of which is to say that these companies are unique in this regard, or that this is all bad. Part of why these companies have done as well as they have, growing to the scale required to provide us with cheap and free goods and services that would be difficult to have at any price otherwise, is that they've evolved, they've changed over the years. That's natural, and it's something that almost every company in any industry that is successful has to do at some point lest they limit themselves with unreachable goals that don't necessarily fit their collective ideology anymore. That said, the reputational hit that these companies have taken in the age of abundant trolls, bots, political flame wars, and debates over PC culture, online abuse, and the platforming and deplatforming of various ideas has been significant. Facebook was once perceived to be a cool, future-facing place to work, but today it's become something of a wealthy leper still rolling in dough, but not necessarily something that you'd want to rub off on you, not something you necessarily want to be associated with. The same is true, to varying degrees, of Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and Apple, each for different things, different sets of scandals and policy decisions, and in some cases specific choices that they've made about rules and bans and other things of that nature. 
But in each case, the public persona of these entities have been damaged, and thus it makes a sad sort of sense that some of the individuals who make up the larger masses of their employment base, especially those in upper management, might be targeted by people who see themselves as the good guys, as the freedom fighters taking on the man, the big bad, and they're just out of necessity using asymmetrical tactics to do so. There's a good chance that some of these people, these doxers, these swatters, see their behavior as thumbing their nose at the seemingly ultra-powerful and unassailable forces that shape the world around them, not considering, as they do so, that real people with real concerns and families and hopes and dreams could be traumatized or hurt or killed by their actions. Actions that are performed, usually, at a sort of psychological distance because of the virtual digital nature of the whole process. They don't need to leave their homes or even think super hard about what they're doing before they do it because of the availability of these sorts of tools. There's also a good chance that they haven't considered the broader implications of these sorts of acts, from the effect that it has on the individuals behind those SWAT shields and armor to the amount of public resources that they're wasting on their pranks, their hoaxes. This is as much as anything else, by the way, why these acts are being punished increasingly harshly, because it drains a lot of money from public coffers. We live in a world in which our online activities are increasingly closely tied to our real-world activities. Online bullying and harassment and stalking and trolling may not seem to have real-world consequences, but they always have. The effects such behaviors can have on the minds and the lives of those on the receiving end has always been real and potentially quite negatively impactful. But because our names, our information, our finances, our cybersecurity systems, our smart devices, our cars are all increasingly interconnected, tapping into the online world for increased powers and capabilities, we're also increasingly prone to a wider variety of attacks than ever before, with broader ramifications and fewer ways to extract ourselves from the situation completely, or stand a chance of protecting ourselves with any likelihood of success in the future. These issues are amplified by other social issues, from the abuses of massive technology companies to the increasing militarization of local police forces. These problems connect to other problems and create new, weaponizable problems that can be tricky to solve because of their interconnected, multi-component nature. This is not a problem that's likely to go away anytime soon, and every new solution is likely to open as many doors as it closes. Griefers gonna grief, trolls gonna troll, and violent and abusive people will use whatever they can get their hands on to increase the range and potency of their violence and abuse. There is a chance that future regulations and laws could help stifle some of these acts by imposing greater punishments and upping the risk factor for those involved, for those thinking that they might want to commit this kind of act and thinking, well, maybe I'll get away with it, maybe the punishment won't be so bad, even if I get caught. To quote Brian Krebs, that security expert and swatting victim that I mentioned earlier, quote, like any other type of crime, when the cost is zero and the deterrent is very low, you've created a perfect opportunity for people to pour time and resources into that crime, end quote. Upping the cost and reducing the casualness of committing such crimes will not solve the overall problem, but it may stop a large number of individuals from casually deploying such powerful tools in such harmful ways, which is the only semi-reliable option we really have when it comes to this particular type of crime at the moment. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. Becoming a patron at any level gets you access to an additional episode of the show each month, but such contributions are also the reason I'm able to commit the time that I do to this show in the first place. So in becoming a patron at any level, you are, in a very real way, making this show happen for everyone. A huge thanks to everybody who's already contributing in some way, shape, or form. I very much appreciate that. And thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. And if you haven't checked it out yet, I have a relatively new project called Brain Lenses. If you enjoy this show, you might enjoy that project, which is focused on the variables that distort the way that we see the world, both internal and external, the things that shape our perception of everything. You can check that out if you're curious at brainlenses.com. The book that I'd like to recommend today 
is called The Math of Life and Death, Seven Mathematical Principles That Shape Our Lives by Kit Yates. This was a really enjoyable book, and I had trouble summarizing it for myself, but the summary provided by the publisher is thankfully a lot more succinct and descriptive than anything I could come up with, so I'm just going to use that here. Quote, In the math of life and death, Yates takes us on a fascinating tour of everyday situations and grand-scale applications of mathematical concepts, including exponential growth and decay, optimization, statistics and probability, and number systems. Along the way, he reveals the mathematical undersides of controversies over DNA testing, medical screening results, and historical events, such as the Chernobyl disaster and the Amanda Knox trial. Readers will finish this book with an enlightened perspective on the news, the law, medicine, and history, and will be better equipped to make personal decisions and solve problems, with math in mind, whether it's choosing the shortest checkout line at the grocery store or halting the spread of deadly disease." End quote. So in essence, what I took away from this was a new set of useful heuristics, of mental shortcuts. This is not a book that requires you to know about math or to even like math. It's something that allows you to appreciate the big picture of the application of math. So if anything about that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of The Math of Life and Death by Kim Yates. You can find out more about me and my work, including the books that I've written, at colin.io. You can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find some of my other projects, primarily written projects, at exilelifestyle.com, brainlenses.com, and askcolin.com. Feel free to reach out and say howdy on your social network of choice. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook, and at Colin is my name on pretty much all the other ones. Thank you so very much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Thank you.